Welcome to Kuvudu, the sorcery of copper. So, today we're gonna take apart a cashier register. It's been lying around here a long time. Nobody uses it and they want to get rid of. But before getting rid of, I want to take it apart. So this is a Samsung Sir 6502 Systep electronic cashier register. It seems quite new. There's even the foil on the on the screen, but I don't expect it to be too hard. A couple of free days for the mechanical part, um, a thermal printer, some keyboard, and just some kind of screen. But before we take it apart, let's see if actually it still works. So here we have the wrist plug. Go in. Oh, it makes noise. And it prints. Closed. With some weird signs on top. And the printer seems to work. It came also with a bunch of keys. Maybe for switching the modes here. There are some two serial outputs and then RC. I don't know if this is for a barcode scanner, something different. And there is a keyhole in the front. So I actually found out what the keys are for. Here we have two pair of keys which close or open the box for the for the printer so you can change the paper roll. The other pair of keys just opens or locks the metal box where you can put money in, but actually it doesn't really open it, so I have to figure out how to open it. And then we have five pairs of key which have actually different privileges. So first we have the rec key, which you can only turn to register, and that's all. Then we have the VD key, probably stands for void. You can go to void or up to X. Then the Z key, which probably, as you might have guessed, can go to void and up to Z. The P key, which void for P and to until P. And then the C key, which is the master key and can do everything. I think this device is buggy because independently of the mood I am, it gives very weird signs. So, but the key, the difference in the key is actually the indents, which you can see here. So for example, for the red key, you only have two indents, then you have even more indents, and the, the bar, which is here, so in the beginning it's it's quite large and then the C key, the most powerful key, has very short a very short tab and then the, the three indents compared to this one which is a long tab and two indents. So I could not find out how how to open the tray using the key and switching to the different modes and then pressing on the keys. But as you can hear, the keyboard works. So when you change, I think this is where you program, this is where you change the mode. Since there's no mode programs, it's just complaining. But I couldn't find any any key which opens this tray. Um, also, there's this button, which just feeds paper. And uh, this is quite a generic, actually, keyboard. It came also with this paper, and I think you just have to push it under the plastic thing, let's see, yeah, so you can put it on the plastic thing. Oh, it's actually stuck on this side. Let's see if we can, ah, here's the keyboard. Oh, nice buttons actually. I expected it to be ah, soft metal domes and not real tactile buttons. Hmm. But I have to find out how to open this, this tray and to see if there's a bit of money inside. So that's the bottom of the machine. 
that's probably a serial number. And I didn't find a button on the keyboard to open the tray, but here there's a lever, which when you press, just magically opens the tray. And, as expected, there's nothing inside. But, when you have a look at the keys, they are not very hard to copy or to get. This lock doesn't look hard to pick. And this lever doesn't look hard to reach. But when it's in front of the cashier, it's probably not very easy to open this device and to lift the cashier system, cash, cash register, without having anyone noticing you. So, probably it's okay, else they would have put more sorts and security in it. The tree is quite easy to remove. Just slide it, and then you can first remove the plastic which is inside. Said so there's no money or secret nose. And then just shift up. So here we have the tray. And the inside is quite simple. We just set a spring to put the tray in the front. Here is a micro switch. And here is some kind of relay for releasing with cables going to the cashier machine, cash register, and some knobs here. Seem quite easy. Oh no, this is probably holding it. I'll try to get the top part apart. On the bottom there's also a nice display. You can shift up if you want, even higher probably, and then turn around. Yeah. Nice machine. I think I'll keep this display, it looks nice. Removing the top part was quite easy. You just had to remove two screws. One here, which is actually connected to this green ground cable. And one in the back, which is also to connect to the ground. And then once you unscrew this, you can just take the thing and get it off. Now that we have the top part, we want to remove the cover, and it's quite easy too. There is one screw here, one screw here, and one screw on the back, just right here. And once you remove the three screws, you can just lift the cover. Oh, let me do that. And here we have the inside of the machine. A giant transformer, a board with a giant capacitor, probably for the thermal printer, the thermal printer, and cables for the displays. And that's it. So, as expected, very simple. The heat sinks are quite, are quite huge, actually. And this is the complete board. What's funny is that it's actually a mix between a lot of surface mount devices and then we have through hole devices a bit everywhere here and here, but this is this is normal. And if you look closely at it, the seal screen is black and not white. And here we also have the, the serial number. So I don't know if it's visible. Yeah. So it's a sale six thousand five hundred two revision one dot two. I think they make good work. They don't have a lot of revision, and it seems to be from. August 2001. Uh, pretty old board, but apparently the machine has never been used. So, let's start with the board. Here we have the main transformer. There is a fuse right there, two smaller caps, a huge 50 volt 6800 microfarad capacitor, and here probably the bridge to rectify the AC into DC. There is a smaller transistor and a huge Darlington transistor, which is finally controlled by even one more transistor. So you could say it's a three-stage transistor. On the side here, you have two inputs, two times serial, and this is actually an Ethernet port. You can see from this protection inside, and this is an Ethernet controller. This microchip only an internet controller. This is flash for the main CPU. Here we have the debugging port. Uh, 
What's funny is that this main CPU is a multi-core CPU, integrated multi-core CPU, with, here's the clock, with, which also integrates an Ethernet controller by itself. So I don't know why they need two Ethernet controllers, so maybe this is just a peripheral, I don't really know. So this one has its own clock, the main CPU has its own clock, and here we have several options. Either you use EEPROM, but they seem to use Flash, this is RAM, and then we have three other slots of RAM. The two connections here are one, this connection is for the mode switch, where you turn the key, and this connection controls the two displays, which, which we have. And on this side we have the backup battery to probably keep the memory intact, but also to provide this real-time clock. This is a real-time clock with, here we have a 32.768 kilohertz clock, so quite typical for, for real-time. And here we come at the bottom. So here we have the flex cable for the keyboard itself. Um, these are multiplexers for the keyboard, obviously. Here we have drivers, like here. Here there are a lot of, of drivers which control this uh, MOSFETs, and these MOSFETs then in turn control the thermal printer. I thought I wanted to keep the thermal printer, but when I see the number of connection you have to prove to, you have to drive, and the huge number on MOSFETs, I, I don't think that only for this thermal printer I'll keep it. But we we'll also have a look at the thermal printer. And finally, I removed the sticker, but here we have a UV reusable ROM which in a in a dip package and this is also again a 8-bit microcontroller and i think this 8-bit microcontroller is just used to to handle the keyboard here um that's why you need the drivers the multiplexers and and yeah a dedicated eprom this is also run for this microcontroller probably and here on the side we have even more connections which are not populated that seems to be another surface mount microcontroller with a lot of pins but I'm not sure what it's used for maybe in maybe in an additional option but we have quite a few uh, jumpers here we have some jumpers here this is the mode we have two jumpers here and that's all which on off jumpers I don't really know what they do so quite a simple board and there is not a a lot to harvest in it. We'll have a look at the printer and the, the displays. And I have to correct myself. This transistor is obviously not to rectify the CNC. For that you need a bridge rectifier and it seems to be just behind here. You cannot see it that well, but just behind this huge um, this should sink, heat sink seems to be the bridge rectifier, as, as I expected. I was also wondering what it was. I just removed the cover and as we can see, we have two, two printer sides actually. One for the customer and one for the merchant, which keeps inside so they can have a, a copy of whatever they sell. And then we have two in the wall, here's the small motor, which turns this wheel and gets this paper off. But I'm interested in, to look in the inside how the printer works. I just removed this sort of band from here. I thought thermal printer only needed to, to warm up thermal paper. But it also needs this kind of, like you used to have for fax machine, old bands which you can use the ink from. But this seems to be maybe just to, to get the heat better transferred. Seems to be just to be some, some textile of some sort, some fabric. I don't really know, but when you put the power on, you'll see there's the head moving. You get the power. Hmm. Not working anymore. See. It works and then up, the printing hand just works, just moves and prints along the two paper trails. 
Let's take it apart. I don't pay attention, but here's a funny message. When I probably when I first put the machine, gives the ID of the machine, so 6540 actually. Uh, number two, the version of the software, and then the date code, boot version 1.02, default keyboard, and some kind of serial number. And here is the printer disassembled, and it's actually a lot easier than I thought. There are two huge resistors, 10 ohm, 10 ohm resistors, just next to two transistors, probably these are for the motors, or for the head, I don't know. Two other transistors, where you can even see which is the emitter, the collector, and the base, the connector to the printer head. Uh, on the back, you have some this bar to make the head travel. If I just turn it, makes the head travel. And then you have light barriers. There's one here, and there's one here, so we can figure out when it's at the end. And the printing again is quite boring, actually. You can see everything from here. Here on the top are the points, the dots which activate, I don't know if it's an electrical shock or electric barrier or, or if it's warm, but this is what makes the up on the paper and it's actually simple, pretty simple. And here's a motor to, to make the head move from left to right. A bit disappointed, but it's cheap and it's reliable it seems. And here I assemble back the printer, the keyboard, and it seems to work. Let's right, switch it on. Yeah, this works. But I don't know how to make it print. I couldn't find any mode which makes it reboot and print print the current status. I mean, none of the buttons work. And the modes still look as crappy. The printer really seems to be broken because I found the programming manual and the operator manual, they're quite easy to find on the internet, and there is actually some diagnostic tools, so it tells to insert the key, go into the S mode with the C key, S stands for service mode, and C, the C key is the most powerful, which allows you to go in service mode, then press 1, 0, um, subtotal, and then so here you can see one zero subtotal, then one of the codes for the service programming will try the printer test, so four, and then cache. But as you can see, it doesn't do anything. And the same for the other service programming modes, we'll try the display test. So it's one zero subtotal, Display test is 6, 6, x times cache. As you can see, the display doesn't test at all. So there seems to be something broken inside. I don't know if it's the ROM or if the ROM has been erased. It was there. But it's not really important. That's our machine which is not used anymore, and we just wanted to look what's inside. And here we have the two vacuum fluorescent display with actually an HV518P from a brand I've never heard, Supertex Incorporated, but the data sheet is available. So probably that's the only thing you can keep and reuse in the project because although they are quite bulky, these devices are quite nice. I played a bit more about it. And as you can see, I could have printed it quite a lot. So what I did is I, I shorted this battery out just by using two probes for a very short amount of time until it resets everything. Push back the keyboard in. Um, put power. And 
it prints the beginning. And from that on, I was able to access the operation menu or the service menu. So you should put the key into the service mode, which is the, the further away. It uses the C key. And then you can take from the program manual or operation manual, program manual, uh, program manual, you can look at the diagnostic capabilities. So we just had need to press one, two subtotal and then one of the diagnostic we want to do, which are listed here. So we'll try one, zero, subtotal, and then uh, let's try the display test, which is number six. Six. Oh, I did something wrong. Clear. One, zero, subtotal. Yeah, service code, service code six, x times. And now you can see the display works quite well. It's just crappy data after the initialization. I don't know if it's in the RAM or something like that. And after some time, it gets stuck. Um, after one or two days, you cannot go to the service code again, and you cannot type service code again. And whenever you press a button, sorry, um, it will make a loud beep. So there's definitely something wrong with this machine. Another thing I was wondering about is that the this vacuum fluorescent display has a lot of segments and as we see this HP 518P from Supertex is um, a display driver but only for 32 channels and only this one has already more than 32 channels you can see it from the pin in the back what you can see here also is that in the middle there are some pins so these are from the screen, and in the middle there are some pins, and if you look at the side, you see one chip here, and one chip on the other side. If you count the pins, and you can briefly look, it looks the same. And my guess was that you had multiple of these display drivers. And this is also why you have also multiple entries. So you have the voltage, the ground, the VPP for the fluorescent tubes, and then several data in so you can talk to the three of them. How to verify it is just by looking at the pins. So if you look at the data sheet, um, pin 20 is ground, uh, pin 40 is VDD, and if it's the same at all and on this board, then it, the guess is quite high that it's the, the same chip. So let's go into the continuity tester. And if we try this is pin 20. Just with one head is quite hard. Yeah, as you can see, it's also the ground pin. Um, you can see it from the from the color traces. So it's the same for here, same for here, and you have to believe me that pin 40, which is this one, it's also the same on the on the two other boards. Yep. It beeps. Um, and still, three, uh, three, three times 32 is 96. Um, I mean, if, because of this dot metric display, there could be more than 96 um, display drivers. So another thing you can see is that when you put it on, No matter in which mode you are, so no matter what you type, whatever is displayed on this seven segments part is also displayed on the back and seven segment part. And if you look at the back of the screen, you can see some of the traces going from this compartment go up here, and then from here they go to this connector, and from this connector they just go to the, here, yeah, this is the connector, they just go to the other screen. So this screen is has the, uses the same pins as this seven segment screen, which um, is quite a clever trick. And, and in addition, the cashier can see the seven segment for for more information, while the customer only sees the prices displaying on this information. So I'll use the I'll I'll keep this display, and the rest is just garbage, and I'll get rid of it. But it was fun to take apart.